Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. I'm going to start today with our first goal, which is hopefully you've been thinking about teammates for a lab. If you haven't, this starts to get you thinking. If you know who you want to team up with, let's say teams of two or three, you may sign your name. If you don't yet have a teammate or teammates, I guess you could put your name on one of the lines and put some question marks in the following blanks and then maybe we can figure out how to team up. But what you want to do for a teammate is actually find someone that has a compatible schedule. You're on your own during the, let's say, the working hours to find a time slot that you can go into the lab physically and capture the data. But you'll want to do that after you have actually prepared for the lab, which means looked at the notes, watched the demo, figured out what you will be collecting in terms of the laboratory data when you get in there, and then it shouldn't be too hard. It'll take longer for the computer to turn on and come up. It's an old computer because we have boards in it than for you to probably collect the data. That's the first thing today is if you know your team members, go ahead and sign up, and if you don't, this is a good time to start thinking about who you can pair up with with a compatible schedule. Homework two is due a week from today and all of that material and including homework number one will be covered on exam number one which is Friday the 26th. Today what I want to do is complete the vector linearization example, have you already done that? That was your homework assignment for today for class. Did everyone complete that? And don't look at me with blank stares. I guess you can. We'll work through that and then we will start getting into system identification which is really what lab number one is about. Except we will start our system ID or system identification with a first order system then we will progress into a second order system and the second order system is what you have in the lab which is a mass spring damper and we'll identify that or we will identify systems one of your homework problems is a first order system we will be applying a constant input I may have said a step that step is some constant amplitude and then you watch what the output does as a function of time and you determine what your transfer function is based on that time response data. Here is our example that we had started with to try to get a feel for doing a linearization and this one ballooned on us in terms of it got bigger quicker in that it's now a second order system. It's not a first order system and now we have some X double dot, the time rate of change of the time rate of change of X of T is equal to some combination, and that combination is a nonlinear combination of X, its derivative, and the input U. And I'm indicating that by saying that's now some nonlinear function G made up of these three different variables let's say position, velocity, and input, u of t. And that's a nonlinear expression. We want to now linearize that. And how do we do that? Or what's going to happen now? Or on the exam, you're going to go, now what? Well, hopefully you know what to do after studying for the exam, and there are practice exams on the D2L website, as a reminder. Several exams, you might want to take some of those blind, meaning without solutions, and then compare your solutions with the exams that I have produced solutions for. And there's many different ways of working problems. But in this case, we have a second derivative equal to some expression. And what is the representation that we're usually looking for when we are thinking about linearizing or even if that G was a linear expression of X and X prime, 
what would we like to see this if somebody said, oh, give it to us in a state space representation? What do we usually like to see on the left-hand side of that equality? The first derivative, right? Not a second derivative. What's that doing there? So we have to modify this so that we have a system or a collection of first order derivatives. We have to convert this second order, which is one equation, maybe into two coupled first order equations. And that could be a problem. G could actually be a linear expression. I, and I say find the linear state space representation of this. And that could be a valid question that you might want to work on. But here, the first thing we want to do is convert this higher order differential equation into a set of coupled first order differential equations. That's what I'm going to say here, is let's rewrite this, x double prime, as two first order coupled, can I use some more adjectives? Two first order coupled, and now we're on to a differential equation. Do you remember the approach that we use or one technique for doing that? For finding a or converting a higher order differential equation into a set of coupled first order differential equations. Hopefully my mic hasn't been off this whole time. Did you tell me when my mic shut off? I got to it. Thanks a lot. Now I have to go back and re-record this first seven minutes. I guess that's not too bad. Better than 75 minutes, which I've had to do recently. I need to have a lock on the microphone. Hopefully nothing much was missed. Where do we start on doing this conversion? We start defining state variables, don't we? And we need one of those state variables which, when differentiated, will give us x double prime. And a fairly straightforward way of doing that would be to go ahead and let one of our state variables, z1, be x. and let the other state variable, z sub 2, be x prime. And then we have to find equations for z1 prime and z2 prime. That's our objective. So z1 prime, the time rate of change of z1, by definition, is simply the time rate of change of x. And we want to write this as some combination of x, x prime, and input u. And this one's easy, and it's maybe too easy because it, that makes it hard, but x prime we've already defined as a state variable. That's simply z sub 2, and we're really finished. That's now a first order differential equation in terms of these new variables z1 and z sub 2. And we could call this our f sub 1 of z1, z sub 2, and u. That's our right hand side. But f sub 1 is simply z sub 2. Now we get into the more interesting expression, z sub 2 prime. By definition, z sub 2, we define that to be x prime. We take the derivative of z sub 2, that gives us the second derivative of x. And that was actually equal to our g of x up here. And now we simply need to replace all of these x's with z1's, all the x primes with z2's, 
and the U's we can leave alone. And if we do that, we now have X2 prime is equal to 4 times Z1 plus 6 Z1 Z2 minus Z sub 2 squared plus U Z sub 2 plus 5U. And that now becomes the right-hand side, F sub 2 of Z1, Z2 of U of associated with or set equal to Z sub 2 prime. We now have a Z1 prime equation. and a Z2 prime equation. And in this particular case, F sub 1 and F sub 2 are nonlinear. And we need to linearize those. Sometimes those might be linear, and then we just could put it in a state space representation directly. Do you remember the expression for what we now have to do, now we have to take all these partials of F sub 1 and F sub 2. We take the partial of F1 with respect to Z1, partial of F1 with respect to Z2, partial of F1 with respect to U. And we put those as coefficients evaluated at the operating point in front of delta Z1, delta Z2, and delta U. So if we do that, Here's what we have. We have delta Z1, the time rate of change of this small variation in Z1 is equal to the partial of F1 with respect to Z1, all evaluated at Z1, 0, Z2, 0, and U0. Those are the nominal operating positions or points or trajectories. Those solve the underlying differential equation. You could think of Think of a satellite orbiting. And now that may be described by a set of nonlinear differential equations, that trajectory. Suppose somebody goes up there and kicks the satellite, or there's some solar wind or something, and it bumps it a little bit out of that nominal trajectory. We want to know how does that satellite behave, what are its dynamics, as it maybe comes back to the nominal trajectory, or if the linearized dynamics are unstable, it now diverts away, and now it never returns to that nominal trajectory. That's what we're trying to do with this linearization. We're saying, suppose that we now have maybe that's our nominal orbit. We now have been bumped off of that nominal orbit, and we want to know, does the, how does this behave? Does it go back? Is it stable as it approaches that nominal orbit? Or is our, linearization showing that around that particular trajectory or that operating point, our system is going unstable. That's what we're looking at or trying to find. By these linearization, by this linearization process, we will get a model that describes the dynamics. Here is our delta x. And we want to know what's the time rate of change of that delta x around that nominal operating trajectory. Sometimes that might be a point. If we had a pendulum, the pendulum's dynamics might have a sine of theta, and that's nonlinear. But at small angles, what's sine of theta? Theta. So we could now approximate sine of theta with theta, and now maybe we have a linearized system dynamic behavior for that pendulum. And we want to know, is it stable? Is it unstable? Maybe we have the pendulum dynamics for the point, the operating point, upright and vertical. As long as nobody breathes or touches, that pendulum's stable, isn't it? 
your bicycle. Your bicycle is an inverted pendulum. Did anyone ride a bicycle this morning into class? Wow. Do you have rudders and some pontoons that you can add to that for later on today? Based on the excitement that's now surrounding us with the weather reports, you'll maybe have to stabilize that bicycle. That's why you're taking this class, right? So you can ride that inverted pendulum. You want to keep that pendulum upright and vertical. And you now need to know what are its dynamics. Well, it might actually be unstable up here. That may be an unstable equilibrium point. Down here, this may be a stable equilibrium point when the pendulum's down below. We want to know, if we linearize this system, what are its linearized dynamics going to be? In this case, we have, getting back to our expression, we have Z1 minus Z1, 0 plus partial of F1 with respect to Z sub 2, again evaluated at the nominal operating point in this case, times Z2 minus Z2, 0. And remember what this represents. This just represents delta Z1. So we're interested in the time rate of change of delta Z1 in terms of some number times the time rate of, or delta of Z1 plus some number times delta of Z2. These are small variations around the nominal operating trajectory. This is still on the right-hand side, plus F1 partial with respect to U, again evaluated at the operating point, times U minus U sub zero. That's the expression. Now you simply can turn the crank in calculating these partial derivatives to find these coefficients. What about delta Z sub 2? Its dynamics are found similarly. We now are working with the second right-hand side, which was F sub 2. Can I just say nominal point, 0, getting tired or lazy? This is now delta Z1 plus partial of F sub 2 with respect to Z sub 2 around those three operating points, delta Z sub 2 plus partial of F sub 2 with respect to U, delta U. In this particular system, I'm talking about a nominal operating point. Or I keep saying that, and what am I really referring to? Well, that, are, that really says those are values for these variables, z sub 1, z sub 2, and u. In this case, we want to know a point, so when F1 of Z1, Z2, and U is equal to zero, and when F sub 2 of Z1, Z2, and U are equal to zero. That's what I mean when I say a nominal operating point. I'm wanting to know what's the equilibrium, and we can find the equilibrium condition when we go back to our original equation, or equations right here, and find the values of Z1, Z2, and U that will force these right-hand sides, these F1 and F2s, to equal zero. What value would we pick for Z sub 2 to make F sub 1 zero? Zero, that's pretty easy, isn't it? Now we have Z2 equal to 0, and we can substitute that in here on F sub 2. And if we picked Z1 equal to 0 and U equal to 0, we would have a nominal point that set all of those Fs to 0. That's the point we're going to 
treat as our equilibrium point. In the inverted pendulum, if we measure the angle theta, let's say counterclockwise is positive theta, maybe we would linearize about theta equal to zero in that nonlinear system. Here we're saying let's call zero our nominal operating point, which allows us now for the nominal operating point to say that we now have z10 equal to zero, z20 equal to zero, and u0 equal to zero. Now that we have that point, now we can start finding values for these partial derivatives evaluated at those at that operating point. We can find the partials, and then if we have any z1, z2s, and u's in that expression that results, we replace those with the nominal operating point, which in this case are all zeros, and we see if there's anything left to give us a number for that particular yellow shaded quantity. Is that clear what we want to do? And again, that will allow us to determine what this satellite is doing here as an example. What are its dynamics a small distance away from the equilibrium trajectory or equilibrium point? Now let's just get into the calculations. We need the partial of F1 with respect to Z1. We go back and find F sub 1, which was Z sub 2. We take the partial derivative of Z sub 2 with respect to Z sub 1. What's that equal? Partial derivatives, we treat everything as constants except for the variable of interest, which in this case is Z sub 1. We're looking for Z1s in that right-hand side. So now I take the partial of, let's say I take the partial of, well, in this case, Z sub 2. Relative to Z1, Z sub 2 looks like a constant, doesn't it? So now I say the partial of some constant with respect to this variable, and the variable is Z1. What's the result? Zero, isn't it? So this partial derivative is pretty trivial. Partial of F1 with respect to Z1 is zero. And we don't even have to worry about evaluating it because there are no left or remaining Z1, Z2s, and Us. What about the partial of F1 with respect to Z sub 2? F sub 1 is Z sub 2. We take the partial of F with respect to X. That's 1. Again, we don't have any Z's or U's left to evaluate that, so that just becomes a constant 1. What about the partial of F1 with respect to U? 0 again. Now we get into the more interesting expressions, and this is why you spend a semester learning how to differentiate, right? We now have the partial of F sub 2 with respect to Z sub 1. F sub 2 had a little bit more structure to it. We differentiate that with respect to Z sub 1. The first term, what's that generate? 4. What's the second term? 6Z2. Anything else? No. So that's the partial of F sub 2 with respect to Z sub 1, whatever that was. 4 plus 6 Z sub 2. Is that what you told me? What's the partial of F sub 2 with respect to Z sub 2? Now we simply go back to F sub 2, find Z sub 2s floating around, and take the partial derivatives of those. Everybody capture that? That's what it sounded like to me. I think it might have been correct, but I don't know. It's hard.
hard to tell. But there's a 6z1, a minus 2z2, plus a u. Is that right? So this is now whatever I just said, 6z1 minus 2z2 plus u. And partial of f sub 2 with respect to u, we need that one. Are there any u's on the right-hand side? The letter u, not u physically. Y-O-U. U could be on the right-hand side. You may not want to say that in an election, right? Right or left. But here we are on the right-hand side. Sorry. There's a big vote today, isn't there? An independence vote? Yeah, stop one. Current event. Everybody pass that quiz? Current event quiz? No? Does anybody know it's going to rain today? <laughs> Did you pass that quiz? If not, you might be in trouble. Bring your galoshes. All right, where were we? Orbiting some space in a satellite. Now we have... Did I do this with respect to you? No. That's what got me sidetracked. You were on the right-hand side, correct? So we now take the derivative of f sub 2 with respect to you, and we have z sub 2 plus 5. Now what? Now we have to evaluate those partials at the equilibrium point, which in this case, we selected an equilibrium point that would cause the right-hand side to vanish, and that equilibrium point actually was all zeros for Z1, Z2, and U. And in this case, we can, any time we have a Z1, Z2, or U, we can set it to zero, and the first partial of F sub 2 with respect to Z1 becomes four. Good, we have a number remaining f sub 2 over z sub 2, nothing. Partial of f of sub 2 with respect to u, 5. And if we put all of those into a linearized state space representation for the dynamics of this small variation of z1 and z2, we had 0 for partial of f1 with respect to z1. We had 1 for partial of f1 with respect to z2. We had 4 for partial of f2 with respect to z1. 0 here. What are the dimensions on my input matrix? As a sort of a test prior to exam number one. Two by one, isn't it? It has to be compatible with the state, so it has to be two rows tall. We only had one input. It's one column wide. Feeding or driving the time rate of change of the first state variable, there was no input directly applied, and in the second one, there was a five. This is now the system matrix A and the input matrix B in our linearized approximation to the nonlinear dynamics of that mess that we started it with at or around one equilibrium point, which was 0, 0, 0. This tells us the behavior around that operating point. If you now walked up and kicked that system, this linearized system, how would it behave? What are its natural <coughs> dynamics? Maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We haven't really talked about this per se, but I just want to let you know that you can start thinking that way. If I said, what are the dynamics of this system, you would say, well, give me the transfer function. And then what would you do? 
you would look at the denominator polynomial, the roots of the denominator give you the poles, you're looking at the poles of the system and you want those poles to be located where? In the left of the complex S plane, in the left half plane. Here we don't have a transfer function but we do have a time domain system matrix A, the eigenvalues of that will give us our open loop dynamic poles in our transfer function G of S. If we now find the eigenvalues of A, that will provide us with how this system would behave in the open loop if you just walked up and kicked it around that nominal operating point of 0, 0, 0. The eigenvalues of A, you can find the values of lambda that allow the determinant of lambda I minus A to equal zero. You're finding those values of lambda that satisfy this equation. Lambda is a scalar, but I is what dimension? Two by two, it has to be compatible with A. Now we have lambda I, so that's just there. We subtract A, and A wasn't too involved. We just had a minus 1 up there and a minus 4 there when we, we subtract A from lambda I. We now want to find the determinant of that, and for a 2 by 2 matrix, what's its determinant? Multiply the, or the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off-diagonals which in this case is simply lambda squared minus a minus 1 times a minus 4, or a minus 4. We set that equal to 0, and what values of lambda satisfy that equation? So now we have lambda squared is equal to 4. We can take the square root of both sides, and we end up with lambda equaling plus and minus 2. Good or not for stability? Not so good, is it, because of this guy, that positive. He's in the right-hand side. So this particular system, the linearized version in the open loop is actually unstable. And we might then want to stabilize that system, and then somebody walks up and kicks it, maybe it goes back to the operating point in a stable manner. That's what we would be doing. Questions on linearization? Vector linearization, yes. So now the question was, why did that positive sign cause all s sorts of problems? Maybe, I rephrased it a little bit, but here we are in the S-plane those eigenvalues actually correspond to poles in our S-plane plot in the frequency domain. And one of those poles is located here at plus 2, and another pole is there at minus 2. If you take this back into the time domain, whoops, maybe I don't want to draw an arrow like that. That looks too much. But where does, what does this produce? This now in the time domain would give us something that looks like that, a mode that looks like e to the minus 2t. What does this pole give rise to as far as a mode? It's now an e to the plus 2t. And now as t evolves, as t gets bigger in time, what happens to those modes? The one on the left decays exponentially, e to the minus 2t. The one on the right, uh, smell anything burning? Smoke? It, it probably burns up your system before it goes off to infinity. It probably saturates and now you've cooked your system. You have to go bother Kurt or Josie and get some more parts in the stock room. Right? Anybody walked up to the stock room window and ordered a cheeseburger? I do occasionally, but I don't get much help. They don't think it's very funny. 
I say put it on my cat card. Any questions on this linearization? So we really sort of got a little bit of a side, but this connects things, I hope, on this last little bit as far as stability. Now what we want to do is try to take time domain behavior and too late. Oh, yes? Yes. All right, let's go on. System identification. Did everyone hear the question? The question was, how big is the delta? Maybe. We are now operating around some opera or nominal trajectory or some operating point. In, let's say, the nonlinear pendulum, you have sine of theta. When is the approximation sine of theta equal to, or approximately theta, valid? Is it one degree? Is it four degrees? Is it 20 degrees? It depends on your system and how well you've stabilized it, but in the inverted pendulum, that angle can actually be quite big, that delta. It could probably be 20 degrees, and you're still probably going to be okay, especially if you've applied a controller to it. But in other cases, it really depends. The answer depends. But now you would have to investigate that and say, how well am I able to stabilize my system around the nominal operating trajectory or around the operating point? How big is my delta? And will my system still be okay if I stay within a certain delta? But by controlling it, you're actually helping your system stay close to the operating point. You're trying to really drive that delta to zero, in a sense. And that's what the dynamics are telling you is how quickly will I go back to my nominal operating point or trajectory from a excursion away from that, a delta away from it. So your answer is it depends. Other questions? Yes. It depends on the designer. It really depends on the system itself. It depends on the system itself and how you have designed it. If it's now in a closed loop setting, you may have enhanced the ability of that system to remain stable by your choice of control. But in some cases, if you're saying, oh, let me just linearize and see what's going to happen, then, you know, how big is that approximation valid is really sort of when is delta of x too big for the system that I'm interested in. And it depends on the system itself. Other questions? Let's get into system identification. Suppose we look at a first order response. An RC circuit produces this first order type of response when we hit it with a constant input. We apply a constant voltage to an RC circuit and it starts responding and going to a final value. And in this case, let's say this is now our response y of t. That's the dependent variable. t is our independent variable. We are now looking to find certain properties of that. We might be interested in where does it finally finish? What's its final value, a1? or we might call that y sub final value. And we might say, here is 
where it is going, but maybe we don't want to wait that far. Exponentially or in theory, when does it reach that final value? Never does, does it? So we usually don't use never if we're doing a design. Your boss might not be happy if you say, if he goes, when's this going to stabilize? And you go, never. He's going to go, you're out the door. Where'd you get your degree? Right? Then you zip it. Keep it quiet. You don't give any more information. Well, you might say, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Realistically, it's going to decay or it's going to reach the final value when. And somebody could say, somebody could get a little bit more smart if you're okay with your boss. Well, it depends. Do you want the 2% settling time, the 1% settling time? 1% settling time, we typically say that's close enough to five time constant, right? This textbook may actually like to use 2% settling time, and then it's four time constants. Let's just say our settling time for today is right there where we're 1%. We've reached within 1% of our final value. And you just told me that that corresponds to 5 time constants. Now, if I said give me a transfer function of a first order system, what would you write down on your paper. If I said, give me the transfer function for a first order system, G of S, how would you write that down? And here I'm going to say pure. Pure means I only have things in the denominator. <laughs> One over S plus one would be a particular first order system. So there was a nominal first order system. What if I want to generalize that a little bit? Then I might want to say, well, maybe I don't know the time constant of that system or where the pole is, but I'm going to put it in time constant form. And maybe I don't know where it will eventually end up so I'm going to call that an alpha. And now I've parameterized my first order transfer function, a pure first order transfer function, fully. I can tell you the amplitude or where it's going to go and how quickly it's going to approach that final value. This now is a general form or structure for a first order transfer function. I know we're expecting a lot of water, but that's not a fish in the numerator. That's an alpha. But it just kind of looked like a fish to me right now. Uh, it's going swimming. Don't let it swim off your paper. But that's alpha over tau s plus 1. Now what do we do? We want to, from this, we are kicking the system with a constant input and we're watching it respond. And it's giving us this response. We can now measure when it gets to that settling time. That will give us our T sub S. We can now extract tau from that. We can relate its final value to what we in injected into the system. Maybe we kicked it in the lab. You're going to kick your mass with an input that's 2,000 counts which is a little bit more than one and a half centimeters. You're going to say, go to one and a half centimeters. Come back. Go back. You'll do that for three cycles just so you see it ring a few times. And you'll have a dwell time of 3,000 milliseconds or 3,000 or three seconds. So you won't be there for 3,000 seconds, just three seconds. You'll go and dwell and dwell. Does anybody want to dance and dwell? So you have three different times that you'll get to see its response. Here, you're just exciting that. And now let's see how we can extract the alpha and the tau from that time response behavior. We know the y 
final value. Do you remember the final value theorem? Just shake your head yes. Maybe I won't call on you. <clears throat> Give me this stare. Final value theorem. Does it involve an S? Yes. It does have an S in it. So this is now the limit as S goes to zero of what? S times y of s, where y of s is the Laplace transform of our output y of t, which we can relate the output of our system to the transfer function by saying, well, we have the transfer function g of s times the input u of s. And u of s, let's say, is the Laplace transform of some a come in for t greater than or equal to zero. Somebody's pencil is not working or they're trying to catch the fish. We're trying to catch the fish because we want to identify what that alpha is. But here is our Laplace transform of the input. So this now becomes A over S. Let's just say that we're exciting that with an amplitude of A. which says then that the final value y sub fs is the limit as s goes to zero of g of s and we parameterize g of, it's s times g of s g of s was this alpha over tau s plus one times u of s which was a over s that s cancels we let s go to zero, and what do we end up with? Alpha a, right? And in our time response, what did we call that final value? We said it was a sub 1, or y sub fv. So this alpha a is equal to a sub 1. And we were trying to identify that numerator alpha and we can solve that equation. We know A, we know how hard we pushed it, we measured A1, now we can identify alpha. Alpha is simply A1 over A. So we now have half of our problem solved. If we now go and say let's find tau, Our 1% settling time, we just say is five time constants, five tau. We can measure that in the response. We can figure out when we get within 1% of where we're going. That's some value. Let's say that's 200 milliseconds. Now T sub S is 0.2. That represents five tau. We just divide that by five and we have tau. Tau now in the denominator is going to be T sub S over 5. That allows us now to say that we have a, we have identified, we've done system identification just by applying a step input to a first order system and measuring the time response behavior. We have identified G of S in terms of settling time and final value to be alpha over tau S plus 1. Questions on that? What are we going to do? Now you're going to look at in the lab a second order system. And it's actually going to be under Dan.
what's that going to look like when we excite that system, a second order underdamped system? Here's y of t versus time. An underdamped second order system. You hit it, and what's going to happen? It's going to oscillate a little bit, but then it will stop, won't it? Depending on how much damping is in the system. We then have a response that does that. Now we have more information to extract second order detail. We have a bump, we have some ringing, we do have a settling time, we have a final value, but now we have an overshoot. And that will give us the additional information that we want. So we'll work with percent overshoot, settling time, and final value to identify a second order transfer function.